for joining me and thank you to the audience who's joining us today. My name is Amelia Danzica and I'm the founder of Growth Molecules. And today I'm speaking to the CEO and co-founder, Steve Bernstein of Top Box. And today we're going to talk about NPS scores and why they might not be so valuable. Uh, Steve is not only the founder of Waypoint Group, the company behind Waypoint's top box for customer engagement, listening and retention expansion. He has helped companies all over the world accelerate growth. So with that, Steve, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I always love uh, speaking with you. Likewise. And yes, so today the whole end goal of this uh, session together is to talk about why it's time to move beyond NPS and how to develop your customer feedback strategy. So with that, Steve, I'd love to hear just a little bit for the audience that's really interested in, in following your career steps. How did you even end up as the CEO of Topbox? Oh, well, um, so I, so uh, through, uh, you can see I'm an old man, right? So th through the 90s, I managed a product line at Cisco Systems um, and needed customer feedback to be able to do it. But in the, you know, even though the internet was around and well, and Cisco was a great, great technology oriented company, there weren't technologies really to get feedback at scale. It was a lot of focus groups. It was a lot of phone calls. Um, and, and trying then to distill that feedback into something usable that uh, not just for me, but to be able to help shape the product packaging, pricing, delivery, all, all that became something that uh, was really important to be able to do with customer feedback in mind. So um, after that, I went to a company called Satmetrics. We were the company behind the net promoter system. I see you smiling, right? So all that research that Satmetrics did around what really is a good designation of a loyal customer and how to use new modern internet technologies to be able to understand that at scale. The thing that pe most people don't remember though is all that research was done with consumer industries, right? If you read the book, you'll see in the appendix, the 21 different, 22 different consumer industries that we researched. Um, and uh, when I left Satmetrics um, as one of the co-founders here at Waypoint Group, our mission was really to work out a similar kind of methodology for B2B. And there are a number of uh, differences in B2B, which I think we're going to talk about. So um, that's kind of what, what brought me here was how do B2B companies really um, understand what a loyal customer looks like from a uh, customer feedback and sentiment perspective, and how do you use the feedback to your advantage? So tell me a little bit more about B2B strategy. Why isn't NPS enough when it comes to SaaS and business to business? Uh, there's a number of things that are really different in B2B. First of all, you almost always have sort of a buying committee, right? In consumer, somebody goes to the store or checks into a hotel and you know who the buyer is. In B2B, it's way more elusive. Um, mm -hmm. There's usually a group of people that come together to make that buying decision. Um, on the other hand, even if you're sort of a product-led growth company and it's very end user base, you, you, you still need to understand the elements of value that you're bringing. In consumer, you don't necessarily think about necessarily a return on investment. It's really all about the experience. In B2B, it's much more about the outcomes right, that products will bring. A, a third and really important um, element to this also is um, that people come and go all the time from companies, right? right. I think the, the biggest reason of churn, in fact, that we tend to see is just, you know, loss of a decision maker, loss of an executive sponsor or loss of a champion, loss of, right? When, when somebody leaves that job and goes and takes a, a different role somewhere else, um, you want to make sure that the person that's going to be replacing them isn't going to upset the apple cart, right? From a vendor perspective, it's important to make sure that you, um, you know, surround yourself really with as many promoters as possible to make sure that those changes, which happen on a regular basis, aren't going to negatively impact you as a vendor. That is such good insight, and and I'll give an example to to further support your your thesis around what I think are called relationship maps. And last week I interviewed Ziv Pilad. He's the chief customer officer of Apps Flyer. And yep. he said the average 
uh, buyer of his plot of his products that he represents is less than two years. And so if you think about that, and he's now been with the organization for nine years, he has customers that have moved companies four plus times and every time bringing apps flyers with them. And that just speaks exactly. volumes about why churn is related to relationship management and why it goes beyond NPS. Yeah, it's not enough to just say, how likely would you be to recommend? You have to understand why, and then you have to follow up, right? And I guess there's another really important consideration in B2B, which is that, um, you know, consumer, we talked about detractors, passes, and promoters, right? Mm -hmm. Those uh, as essentially those three different groups. In B2B, right, because you don't necessarily know who the buyers are and you don't necessarily understand all of the nuances about the way they are using the product, et cetera, um, there's really a fourth group, which is the silent customers, the silent people, those, those non-responders, right? So in, in consumer, uh, you take a sample strategy, right? And you get feedback until you reach your sample quota or until, um, you know, whatever that sampling strategy is. In B2B, census really is the name of the game, right? You want to try mm -hmm. to get feedback from everybody that has an opinion about the product or service that you offer. Um, and as a result, a lot of times, if you don't have a relationship, you get silence, you get those crickets, right? So um, response rate tends to be a really good proxy for relationship strength. Um, but that's also, you know, presupposing or pre-assuming that you already even know who the right contacts are, which is a, which it tends to be a problem in B2B, right? Where you're ending up mixing apples and oranges by just sort of blasting out uh, a, a survey invitation to a whole set of your database and you're mixing decision makers and champions and end users and all these different persona that absolutely have to be considered in B2B, right? I mean, that I think, I know you do a lot of persona work, so it is probably, uh, I, I suspect not very controversial for, for you, but right, an important element. I, I think so, but for our audience, I would love for you to share because what we're saying around relationship strategy, it can be controversial. I think a lot of people are so fixated on health score, but they forget yeah. that if that champion leaves, then what? And when I'm working with companies and I see they have one relationship, one contact in their CRM or customer success platform, that is immediately a red risk for me. And oh, I, okay. I, I would love for you to share a case study around how you helped a company develop a feedback strategy where it was based on relationship management and how you were able to tie that to churn or right. preventing churn, right? Uh, well, let's take a couple of different examples. I mean, so um, mo in most companies, I think almost, I would venture to guess every company has issues with their CRM, right? Where it tends to be organized nicely for sales or support, but customer success might have some different use cases. And, and so what happens a lot of times in CRM is that we don't necessarily see all the contacts that should be there, right? Getting populated in there, not only, you know, um, at, you know, not only not having the right contacts, but also not having the right designations like persona, tiers, other segmentation data, other metadata that's important to understand who this account or who this customer really is. Um, so what, because Topbox, I mean, one of the biggest factors or strengths I think of Topbox is that we, it's all about asking for feedback we say from the right people at the right time. So based on where the customer is in the life cycle, there's different um, points of asking different types of contacts for, the, for that feedback. And because it's sort of an ongoing drip, right? Where it's based on individual accounts and where they are in their life cycle, there's no big sort of survey event. And because there's no big survey event, it's really easy to clean up contact data as you go along. Mm. Right. And, and so it's a long answer to a short question, but this is an important distinction because in these sort of survey events, nobody has time to go in and clean up all the database. Nobody has time to go in and do any follow up. Nobody has time to really take action on what they're getting. What, the, what they really get is sort of just a measurement readout. The value, though, in this sort of approach is let's make sure we're asking the right people the right feedback or the right questions at the right time. So 
get a task that pops up that says, you know, hey, this account is going to be selected for feedback um, next month. Make sure that you do the following things, right? And, and so we send these tasks off to the CSMs to make sure, first of all, have what we call a, a pre-discussion with your customer, just to position, this is not a survey. We need your feedback and we're prepared to address it. So in order to make sure you fulfill that commitment, you better be able to have resources. And I would say the, the customer success organization is a, the key place to do it, to be able to follow up and, and address what people are telling you. Now that's not necessarily to say that, uh, you know, the, the follow-up is about learning. I mean, sure, the follow-up process is about learning and addressing what they tell you, but most of the time, the follow-up process, just, just being there, just showing up and demonstrating that you listen, that alone sig significantly helps develop the relationship and it helps you understand what they're telling you, but it also helps the customer understand that you care. And that's right. so important, right? Um, I, I know I'm off topic, right? But this whole idea then of getting the right feedback from the right people at the right time. So we, we've got clients that use this kind of approach with, to go hand in hand with QBRs. Mm. Um, one of the major milestones in the relationship is working out, you know, where and when the, the Q, the EBR or the QBR, right? That business. EBR. I like EBR. EBR. Okay. <laughs> so the, that executive business review, usually it's really hard to get people there. And usually right. a lot of people find them to be a waste of time. And I would submit that that's because of your mm. agenda and because yeah. of the way you present it. So what we'll prescribe and what, what, where a lot of the value comes from, in fact, we have a case story on the website that we can point people at, but um, before the EBR, that's, a, that's the time to understand really what's working and not working. So you can use that executive time in the EBR to work on what we call joint success planning. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for doing what here? Um, who's gonna make sure that this element of change manager gets done or that this element of training gets done or that, you know, sometimes the vendor can do it, sometimes the customer can do it. So what we, uh, you know, one of the most significant use cases here is before the EBR, we collect what we call deep and wide feedback from all of the people that matter. Topbox will distill that into a series of visualizations then that you can put it directly into the slides and show, you know, here's the sentiment and why. Here's what's working and what's not working according to your community of people inside your organization. Now, as an executive, now that you've seen that, right, and you're, as an executive, you should really care about what people are thinking and feeling about the tools and whatnot that you use. That's the time to drive joint success planning. And now to your point about case story, it's those discussions about joint success planning that almost always result in cross-sell, upsell, expansion opportunities, right? Amazing. So you're not, you're not going in to try to sell them something. You're going in to try to problem solve with them and create that, right, that, that plan. Um, and in that process, right, it, you, it's a really easy opportunity to explore gaps in the product or solution set that that customer really should have, right? Yeah, you guys don't have that module. Therefore, you're experiencing this kind of thing. You have to do all these workarounds. Or you guys don't have our, our extended success package, whatever that might be, right? So therefore, you're not getting the kind of hands-on expertise that we might otherwise really like to provide, right? Those kinds of things are great expansion opportunities, but they also are the opportunity to convert that account from being a detractor to being happy. Right. And then right. as people start to leave and they go to other jobs, they do take you with them to mm -hmm. Ziv's point. Um, they'll they'll take you all over the place. That, right. We uh, we have that's how we've fundamentally, I think, uh, done done as well as we have in growing our business is that our customers come back when they go to a new company and they take us with them. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so uh, when I look at the key takeaways that you would be sharing, what you just shared in terms of case studies, these are for enterprise, mid and high touch clients in B2B SaaS. And you want to prepare your clients for feedback or letting them know that you're going to be collecting feedback. You definitely want to follow up. I don't believe enough companies do that. You want to have a joint success plan where there's the opportunity to cross-sell and upsell. 
And last but not least, you need deep and wide feedback. Is there anything else that you would add as closing remarks for this mini series on why B2B SaaS companies should move beyond NPS? I, I mentioned it at the beginning, and I know at the risk of rambling and repeating myself, the, the silence is, you know, yes, we say silent, silent but deadly. You're right. So um, <laughs> the, the, the opportunity to increase your engagement rate by demonstrating that you care is, is something that really has significance. So don't just throw a survey invitation over the wall. No, you know, you'll get five to seven five to 10% response rate. It's not right. And which means 90% of your audience aren't participating. Mm -hmm. Turn that upside down, right? By communicating to your customers, what's in it for them? Are you going to follow up? Are you going to address what they tell you? That doesn't mean doing what they tell you to do, but a commitment with some evidence that shows you really care, right? Sometimes maybe that's just a phone call. Maybe that's other initiatives that you've got going on. But the more you can evidence that, we've got a ton of examples. I'd love to talk about it, I guess, in a future date of, of how to evidence that you really care and get that response rate up to 80% and higher. We see 80% and higher response rates all wow. the time, which is right, which gives you super valuable feedback about, again, who's with you, who's not with you, and why. Wow, that's, that's that is amazing. I can't say I've ever worked with a company where they've had a response rate that high. And I'm sure so many people want to learn more. So I have two requests. One, will you come back on the show? And and I'd two, love to, if you'll have me. <laughs> and two, how do people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? Um, super easy. I respond to all my email. It's Steve B at waypointgroup.org or on LinkedIn, Steve Bernstein, you know, catch me on LinkedIn. I'm fine to do that. Um, and you can go to our website um, and uh, just there's a little contact me form there. So waypointgroup.org. Someday I'll have to explain why we're .org and not .com. It's, there's a little more to it than just domain name availability because we actually own the, the .com as well. But anyway, waypointgroup.org would be a great place. And I'd be thrilled to be able to provide templates, examples, case stories, any questions about uh, you know, how to do this at scale. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Great, Steve, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. And I am definitely going to have you back on the show because I have so many more questions for you. Thanks again and uh, look forward to continuing the discussion.